jump in and get started. So like I said, this is a um, CASA monthly report and timesheet refresher. Um, I'll discuss why we do monthly reports and timesheets. So that will include um, documentation, guidance on information gathering, strong monthly reports equal strong court reports, communication with the CASA office, collecting data on CASA's efforts and in-kind donations, and then also the, the requirements by OJA, Kansas CASA, and National CASA. So I'll break each one of these down a little bit, and then um, in my next section, I'll kind of cover how to do monthly reports, and that's where I'll pull up actual some examples for you guys, and we'll go through the different sections and what should be included on those monthly reports and timesheets. So right now we are in the why of why do we do monthly reports? Why do we require these? Um, I promise it's not for fun of the, of the office. Um, we have several reasons that we have to keep this documentation. So um, like I say here in my first point, documentation is tedious. It's not always fun. However, it is necessary. So information gathering is one of the four main functions of a CASA volunteer, and it's likely one of the most important functions in my opinion. Um, you guys spend a lot of time gathering information, talking to people. Um, you, you just, a lot of your time goes into collecting information, and if that's not documented correctly, then that's kind of time wasted. So documentation is a huge part of why we require monthly reports. And then my third point here is that CASAs talk to many different people and utilize different forms of communication. So you're kind of all over the place with talking to people in person, um, different meetings with providers, over the phone, emails. So it's important to have a centralized location where you are tracking all of that information and keeping it organized. And so we're hoping, we're hoping that that's what the monthly report tool is used for. Um, so my next point on why we have you do these is guidance on information gathering. So we know that we're dealing with children with complex needs, parents that have court-ordered case plan tasks and ever-changing situations, um, different case team members, legal parties, foster parents, relatives, service providers, and so much more. Um, it's enough to make anyone's head spin and sometimes just identifying what information needs to be collected can be the challenge. It's hard to even know where to start um, and who to talk to and what to ask about. So we're also hoping that the monthly report form is that can be used as a tool for that. So it was designed to be a guide for the information that should be collected and reported to the cost office, other professionals on your case, and most importantly to the court. So the sections on the monthly report form under both the child and parent um, match up with the court report document. And so if sections on your monthly reports are left blank or they're incomplete, then they will also be lacking information when you go to write your court report. So that kind of leads into my next point that strong monthly reports equal strong court reports. So the monthly report form, like I said, was designed to match sections from the court report. And so with that in mind, well-prepared monthly reports should mean that you will have well-prepared court reports and you'll always have the information you need to provide for those. Um, court hearings are scheduled out as multiple months in advance and in some cases, even a year at a time. So there's always wide gaps of time and so we would like to utilize the monthly report as a tool for continuing to gather and document information between those, those large hearing gaps. Um, we never want to get to a point where court hearings are quickly approaching and we realize that we haven't gathered information that's necessary um, or we haven't, maybe you have, you've been working for the past six months and talking to people and doing visits, but that wasn't documented well. And so then when it comes to write that court report, things are forgotten. So um, again, just a tool to keep things orga organized and documented. I am talking fast and I cannot see my chat box right now. So if you guys have questions, feel free to, to I, I think there's a raise hand function or just pop in if you, if you wanna stop me at any point. 
Um, so my last point here, court reports are the culmination of your efforts as a CASA, so we want to make them meaningful. All right, another reason for doing monthly reports is communication with the CASA office. So outside of direct communication that CASAs are having with their um, advocate supervisors, monthly reports are the main resource that they are using to stay up to date on your cases. So besides, um, Sometimes they are included in case activities, emails, case planning conferences, things like that. But otherwise, they are mostly relying on your monthly reports to provide information on what's been going on throughout the, the prior month. Um, and so when you submit those reports and your timesheets to your advocate supervisor, they should be reading through those documents. And then they're also entering them into our database, which we call CASA Manager. And so they're entering information and they're checking on um, and taking note of the information that you're providing. And then they might contact you following up on maybe questions that they have, um, areas that they see that they have advice on someone else you could talk to or more information that can be gathered um, and just any advice on things moving forward with your case. So it just kind of keeps them apprised of where you're at and how things are going and gives them an opportunity to kind of guide you on moving forward. Um, they're also using these documents to verify that monthly child visits are taking place. And if those haven't happened, which we know, um, especially right now, we are, during COVID, we are counting um, all virtual, like if you do Zoom or FaceTime, any virtual visits, we're counting those as your face-to-face -face contact for that month. Um, but we know that there are circumstances where you're not seeing a child during a month if it's the family is just really busy or maybe the kid is in a placement that wasn't accessible whatever it may be um, that happens sometimes and so if an advocate supervisor identifies that on your monthly report they're going to contact you and they're just going to ask for some information so that they can document why a visit did not occur and then they might also have to do something called a visitation exception form, which I'll go into more later, but that's something kind of required by um, our oversight, the Office of Judicial Administration. So if they talk to you about that, that's why. Um, and my last point, if you do not submit monthly reports and communicate with your advocate supervisors regularly, they won't know how to guide you on your case. So they won't know what's going on and they won't know how active you are. All right, um, another big part of our monthly reports is collecting data on CASA's efforts and in-kind donations. So you guys, like I said, you do a ton of work, you talk to a ton of people, um, you are donating your valuable time to this organization. And so your timesheets in particular for this allow us to collect and report this information so that we can recognize those efforts and contributions um, we collect this data and we share it with the community, with our donors, grantors, and um, all community partners, all kinds of different people to, to show what you have been doing for the organization and for the community. So I have an example of this. I just pulled numbers from 2020. So these are the contributions that you guys made based off of the data that we entered from your timesheets. Um, so based on that, in 2020, CASA spent 2,349 hours working on their cases. They drove 15,349 miles, made over 4,000 contacts. That could be with professionals, anyone related to the case. Um, made over 837 visitations to children and donated $35,283 in in-kind donations. So those are awesome numbers. I love to see those and have those to, to brag to people about the work that you guys are doing. Um, I think that they are probably even bigger, but unfortunately we did miss some timesheets and some reports. So we're missing some, some data there, but that's what those are used for. Um, so it's, and it's important that we can accurately track this information so that we can show the true impact that you guys are making. Okay, and this is my last point, I think, in um, why we do monthly reports. It's kind of the least fun one. 
but um, it's basically their requirement by OJA, Kansas CASA, and National CASA. So this is something that uh, when taking on our responsibility and as an organization that we say that we will do. So CASA of Cedric County is a member of both national and Kansas CASA programs, um, which requires us to be in compliance with their standards of operation. Um, and this includes records and documentation of case activity, such as monthly reports and timesheets. And then the operations of CASA of Cedric County directly are overseen by the Office of Ju Judicial Administration, which also oversees the court. Um, and we refer to this as OJA. So CASA undergoes an annual audit by OJA in which the auditor checks case files and they verify that monthly reports and timesheets are being completed and that the once a month trial visits are being made and documented. So they are looking for those things. Um, and if we don't have them in files and they have questions about why we don't have them or why visits aren't happening and those can be written up as um, in a corrective action plan. And then the reports from that audit are sent to um, our district chief and presiding judges. So it just looks kind of bad. It looks like we're not doing what we said we're gonna do. We're not documenting the time that we're spending um, on the work you guys are doing. So we wanna make sure that we have all of that in the files for those audits. Okay, so um, in this section, I'm gonna cover how to effectively complete monthly reports and timesheets. Um, and so I'll cover making sure that you are using the correct and most current forms, um, information to include on the monthly report document, information to include on the timesheet. And then I just have a slide with some reminders. So I'm going to, well, I'll start here. The current monthly report form and timesheet that we're using right now um, were the ones that were implemented back in March. So hopefully you guys have these. Um, I saw a couple of our newer advocates on here. So if you don't have these forms yet, please let your advocate supervisor know and they will send those to you. Um, and if you think that you might not have current ones, I'm gonna pull up examples and I'll show you, but just reach out and let us know so that we can get you those documents. Um, the other thing with these is to simplify the usage. We've made them protected. Um, so you can't edit the formatting of these documents, which means that if you have a case with multiple children, your advocate supervisor will need to send you the document that's formatted for your specific number of children. So if you don't have that correct form, let us know about that also. All right, so this is an example of a monthly report form with two kids. So you'll see first child's name, second child's name. Um, obviously, if you had more children appointed to you, there should be more of these sections. So I want to pull up, I'm just gonna pull up all my links here and get this out of the way. Okay, I think I'll start with just a monthly report and kind of what, what we're looking for here. Um, so we want to make sure that this information at the top is updated. Just make sure you're looking at that every month and making sure it's current information. Your advocate supervisors will be looking to see what court date you have listed and hearing time so that they know that you also, you guys have the same information on when your next hearing is. And if they think that you, you aren't sure, they can let you know so that you have that on your calendar and kind of are aware and looking forward to it. So, and then date of last case plan is another big one. Um, we ask for that because we want to verify that case plans are happening the way that they should and that those are not being missed or overlooked. And we can go to St. Francis and ask questions if we feel like case plans haven't been updated as they should be. So we do ask for the last case plan date and that's something that we track here in the office. Um, so if you're not sure of when your last case plan was, your advocate supervisor should be able to tell you. All right, and then placement information. This shouldn't change unless, of course, there was a placement change within that month that you're reporting on. Um, so if you'll just you, you fill this out one time, but we do need you to look at these questions down here underneath about 
um, any DCF reports made during the month. If you'll just think about it, that's not a common thing. A lot of your cases aren't going to have continued DCF involvement or reports, but it happens. And so um, that's something that we've been asked to track and to report on if there are new reports made. So that's why we ask for those. So if you'll just keep that in mind and make sure to let us know if that is happening. All right, and then um, we get into the sections here, kind of the, the meat, I would say, of, of your report. So this starts with children's progress since the last report. So you're just gonna start with that, think about that month and anything new or current that's happening. Um, and this is in my, I think I have this in another section, but I'm gonna tell you guys, you do not need to start this report from scratch every month. Um, just like a court report, you can pull up the last one and just make changes so that it has the current information, but you shouldn't have to retype like the same education information every month or any of these, any of these sections. If information's the same, you can leave it the same. So, um, so I want to pull up the court report template and just show you guys kind of how this matches up. Um, up here, this, your all persons contacted since the last hearing, that's going to be good information to get from your timesheets. You guys might have a separate place that you're tracking this, um, but for us, it's easy to use the timesheets to fill these out. So if you keep your timesheets current, that could be a tool for that. Um, and then, so down here under the child status, so this was designed to match up exactly with these, these prompts here. So we're just asking you to each month collect the information that we will have you report in a court report. Um, parents, we do break it down a little bit more on the monthly report because in the court report for parents, we just say compliance with court orders and case plan tasks. But that's what all of these things are. These are things that would be listed in their case plan. And so that's a really good tool to use for filling this out with parents. If you have parents involved in your case, is their case plan, what tasks have been court ordered for them to complete. And so those are the things that you're going to want to be reporting on. Um, if you have a case that does not have parents involved, either rights have been terminated or relinquished, we can give you a report form that has this section deleted, or you can just leave it blank. So I'm not gonna go too much into unless anyone has questions or wants me to cover examples of these things, but I think you guys do a pretty good job with this, both in monthly reports and court reports, um, listing or knowing what to include in these sections. Um, and we have some prompts here to the side. So for placement, we're looking at the type of placement, living conditions, who lives in the home, what activities are happening, are there behaviors? things like that. So we have some examples listed out on things that you should be looking for for each of those. Um, and so what we ask is that you just try to be as thorough as possible which, with each of these things um, and report all of the information that you can in this monthly report so that we can then use that information for your court reports. And if you ever have questions, like if you feel like, um, I don't know, maybe you're not sure on medical information for your child. You don't have contact. Maybe it's not a case that has medical needs. So you're not contacting doctors or um, you're not sure where to get information on their most recent can be healthy or something like that. Um, just let your advocate supervisor know and feel free to ask them questions about where to get that information or who you should be talking to. And then they're also gonna be looking at these and like I said, reaching out if they have advice for you, so. Okay, any questions so far? I feel like I'm talking really fast. Um, I might just be covering stuff you guys already know, so. All right, um, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, okay, I did want to tell you, I know some people have a difficult time with the Microsoft Word or Excel documents. You might have a computer that doesn't, um, you don't have those programs. Um, I know we have a problem with 
Mac users, sometimes not having those programs on their computer, they're not supported. So if you need an alternative to, to using Word and Excel, just please let your advocate supervisor know there are some other approved things that document sharing methods that we can use. Um, so just talk to them about that if you need an easier way to share those reports. I had an example here. Um, Google Docs is a good one. And this is something that everyone should have access to. It's an internet file sharing program. It's secure. Um, so you, I think you do have to have a Google account, which you can, anybody can sign up for. So as long as you have a Google account, you can just search Google Docs and it will pull up this document sharing space. And we can upload any form into this. So your monthly report form can be uploaded here and you can just fill out the information and then share it with your advocate supervisor. So, and you can also download these documents and save them to your computer. And then the same thing for the timesheet, it's just called Google Sheets. And so it's like Excel for Google. So that's a good one. But if you need other options, just let your advocate supervisor know and they can help you figure out the best way, the easiest way to share those. Okay, I think I got ahead of myself and I kind of covered um, most of this when I was just looking at the form, but let me just, oh, I see a hand. Bruce, did you have a question? Yes, I did. On the timesheet in Excel, uh -huh. uh, I have had my coach send it back to be signed. Okay. But the form she sends me back does not at all look like the Excel file that I sent her. Yeah. And I'm confused by that. What, what can you tell me? So that is called an hours report form. And I actually do plan to cover that. That's my last thing I have here. So that's a little bit different. And I'll tell you why we're doing that and then information on it. So we will get to that at the very end. Okay, I think I did cover all this information to include in your monthly report. So let's just go on to the timesheet. Um, so I'm going to go off of my slide here because I had some, some things I wanted to make sure I covered. So cases with multiple children, we want to specify which child the activity pertain to. So when you are looking over here, that's your first column is child. We ask for that to be specified because if you have a case with five kids, you might have attended a meeting or even a visitation where we were only talking about one of the children or you only saw one of the children. So we'll just have you specify which one the activity was, was pertaining to. Um, and if it was to all of the kids that you're appointed to, you can just type all into that section. Um, we ask that you list time in hours and or five minute increments. So just round if you need to, if you have like a three minute phone call, round it up to five minutes and so on. Um, just kind of use best judgment on rounding time. Um, we have to, we take all of the entries that you have on your timesheet, your advocate supervisor takes those and manually enters them into our cost and manager database. And so um, that can be tedious and a lot of work for them. So it just helps if they're if it's done in five minute increments, so they're not having to do too much math there. Um, and then mileage is another big one. I think we're kind of missing um, on mileage. I know a lot of people maybe don't think that mileage is important. Like if I drive to see my kid and it's not very far, maybe I'm like, eh, I'm not gonna report that. But we want you to calculate your mileage round trip. So anything you do that is a cost of activity um, we want you to calculate round trip for that case related activity and then report that because those do add up. So if you're um, driving to the office to meet with your advocate supervisor to talk about your case, count those miles and, and log that on your report. Um, and then list out each person that was made during or each contact person each person you had contact with maybe that was that was made during an activity. So um, what I'm talking about here is under persons contacted, if you had a case plan, try to include each person that was involved in that case plan if you can. If it, I know that's sometimes hard to catch who all was in 
involved in like a phone call sometimes, but just try to list out everybody involved and then the relation to the case for those people. Um, Cause we do track those as individual contacts. And then under activity, brief comments, um, that does not need to be a narrative. We don't want you guys to feel like you have to spend a ton of time describing your conversations or what was going on with those activities. We're looking for short statements about what occurred. So my examples are a case planning conference, checked in with foster parents, um, spoke with mom about case plan task progress. So just short statements to let us know kind of what was going on with that communication. That's all we need there. We want the narrative piece to be in your actual monthly report document. Um, do not include time spent, or actually do include, sorry, do include time spent on reading files or documents. So if you are sent a bunch of documents before a court hearing, please try to track your time and put that on your monthly report. That definitely counts as, ca as case time. Um, count time for preparing court reports and for preparing monthly reports. And then you can also track non-case related activity on your timesheets. So like attending this in-service today, if you wanted to list that on your timesheet, you could just skip over like children, just put in date. You can skip these sections and then maybe like you can list me as person contacted and say CASA in-service. So we can track your time spent on non-case related activities also. We'll just pull those things out and track them separately in our database. Um, and then there is a spot for signatures on this form. It says CASA volunteer signature up here. Those are not required. Um, like Bruce said, we have another document that we're asking for signatures on. So don't worry too much about signatures here. Okay. Um, so here's just some reminders I put together about timesheets and monthly reports. Um, they are due to your advocate supervisor by the fifth of, fifth of each month. That has changed. So I know some of you, if you've been around for a while, you probably have the 10th in your head still. Um, but back last year, we decided to change that to the fifth because we have some reports that have to be done for our grantors um, that we need information for by the 10th. So that's why we had to move that date up. Um, but we do understand that life happens. Your, if your reports are going to be late, um, just let your advocate supervisor know that you'll be getting those to them as soon as possible. Bruce. Jokingly, this reminds me of a bill collector that changed the due date. I know. Yeah, that's not very nice to do. It really kind of messes things up sometimes, but... Um, it is really helpful to us because like I said, we do have to do, and that ties into that other document that we send you guys. So I'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, so your advocate supervisors may send you monthly reminders. They might send those out ahead of time. Um, I think they kind of learn like what you guys like and what you need and we'll kind of cater to that, but they might be sending monthly reminders and then they'll follow up with you if there hasn't been communication. I promise they do not like to do that. They don't like to bother you. They don't wanna seem like pests, but um, like I said earlier, these are monthly reports are their way of knowing that you're still active on your case and knowing what's going on with your cases. So they are gonna check in on those if they haven't heard from you. Um, my next one, no case activity is too insignificant for, monthly, for a monthly report or timesheet. So um, if you have a case that's what we would consider winding down, so maybe we're waiting on an adoption finalization or for the case to be closed after a successful reintegration, it could feel like you don't have a lot to report. There's just not a lot going on. Maybe you've made one phone call and done one Zoom visit, um, but that's fine. All of that information um, even those two contacts are worth documenting and we, we want to have those on file and to count those towards our, our time. So, um, nothing is, nothing is too small. Um, and then if you have questions, concerns, frustrations with the monthly report or timesheet process or the documents, maybe the documents just aren't working for you just to have a conversation with your advocate supervisor and they'll figure out how to make that easier. 
Um, I think we have some people that have even called in and we'll just take like oral information and type it out if a document isn't working. So we will do whatever we need to do to make your life easier with these and to help get that documentation done. Okay, so um, here's what Bruce and I have had mentioned already. So it's the signed hours reports. And so let me just pull up an example of this document. Um, so this is gonna come to you. This is what it looks like. It's a PDF and it is just a summary of the time of, of what you reported to us basically from your timesheet for that month. So um, this is an example from November. So we would take this report from November, send it to you in December and ask that you sign it. And so we're just asking that you verify that um, the time looks right based off of what you reported. And then my signature box didn't, I was worried about that with this format. Um, typically when we email this to you, it's gonna have a box down here that you can click into to do an electronic signature. I know that does not work for everyone. Um, I think you have to have like a, a the most up-to-date version of Adobe to use that. And so we have some other options, um, but let me tell you why we're doing that. So these documents are required by a grant, one of our, our big grants. So it's important to keep them happy. Um, and they ask us to document your in-kind time donations. So they wanna see what you're doing, how much time we're, we're doing it. So um, these timesheets, the, the timesheets that you submit to us can't be used and we learned this because they include identifying case information, which the grantors don't want. So they don't want kids' names, they don't want case numbers, they don't want any of the like descriptions that we use for the activities. So that's why we put together, we're, we're doing this report with just very basic, um, your type of contact. And so we, and they're particular about how they are signed. So they wanna make sure that they're considering you technically as an employee. And so this is your timesheet as an employee. And so they need to make sure that it is you signing this document. And so they are pretty particular on how we have those signed. So kind of our accepted options for that right now are either to do that, um, the electronic signature that we have set up, which I have photo like picture instructions for that can be sent if you guys need those again. I sent those out kind of, I think the first time we talked about this, but like I said, that just doesn't work for some, some people who don't have that program. So the other options are, if you have access to a printer, you can print that document, sign it, and scan it back to your advocate supervisor. And maybe you don't have a scanner, but there are um, even like a clear picture of the document would work if you can do that with your phone. Um, there are even some apps. I know I'm an iPhone user, so there are some iPhone apps for scanning documents. And I think you can even do it in your notes, like just your regular notes app. There's a way to scan a document. So that's one option. If you can get it scanned and sent back through email, that's great. Um, the advocate supervisors can also mail you a hard copy. So if that's just easier, if you don't wanna mess with the technology, we can print those out, put them in an envelope and send you a return stamped envelope. And those can be mailed to you and you can just send us, send them back when they're signed. Or we can, if you're gonna be in the office in person, we can have those ready and you can sign them while you're here. Okay, I had some questions it looks like. Uh, Rebecca, maybe? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to let people know that mileage driven for charity um, you can deduct that even if you don't itemize this year because of a special pandemic laws that were passed. I drove over 1,100 miles last year. It adds up really quickly. So just be aware that any charity donations and or mileage driven can be deducted without itemizing this year, which isn't the normal. Yeah, that's good to know. That's definitely a perk if you keep track of those things. 
Okay, and then Angela, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question about the electronic signature. So for some reason, I couldn't get it to work on mine. Um, so I just was in the office and signed mine. But mm -hmm. um, the electronic signature that you guys use on our court reports, can that not be used on that? It can, technically, no. So this okay. is this is Sandra's thing. She's the one who has to keep this documentation and kind of answer to anything that comes back from this. And so... She is not comfortable with that. Um, it, it, I think because technically we could, without your guys' permission in the office, take those and stick those on those documents. And so they want to know that it is actually you signing this. Okay. So okay. that's why we can't do that. We are looking into another, I know people have had a lot of problems with that electronic signature. So we're looking into some other options. Um, for a different program. It's one that I think a lot of real estate people use to like sign real estate docu contracts. Sign. Yeah. Yes, DocuSign. So yeah, and I've done that. <laughs> we are, that's super easy to use. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So I'm hoping that we can get that implemented. Um, okay. I, I think we're looking into cost options for that and just seeing if it would be effective for us, so. Okay, all right, thank as you. As, yeah, as soon as we get something set up, I'll, I'll let you guys know if we have better options. Okay, I talked fast and that was really all I had. So um, are there other questions, comments, um, concerns with monthly reports or when they're due or how to submit them or anything like that? Hey, I have another question. <laughs> Um, so I know you showed the report with, um, several children and uh -huh. I have four on my case and I've always just done it with the one and just listed them all because they're on the same placement. Do I okay. need to switch over to doing that? And then when I go through in my boxes, I just write which one I'm writing about, but like, um, at the top where you had first child, second child, yes. I haven't been using that. I just have the standard one <laughs> okay is that okay I think because your kids technically we're gonna send you a new one we'll send you the right one okay. well um, and mine's winding down too it should be closed next month anyway okay. so yeah maybe we will I'll I'll talk to you are with Sarah Sarah now okay I'll yeah that all remapped in my brain uh, <laughs> I will chat with Sarah about it. Okay. We might just have you finish out your case with the one you have so you don't have to transfer everything over. Um, okay. The only reason for anyone else who might have a similar situation, the only reason I would be particular about that is because um, I think these questions down below need to be done individually for each child. So okay. that would be my only nitpick about that. Bruce? I have the same issue, but just two kids. So okay. I need the new form, too. So you need one for two. This okay. is Rebecca. I need one for two. I okay. would also say, can you please send out a copy of the PowerPoint when you're yes. done, just so I can have it, you know, full size. Sure. <laughs> not, not in the video, tiny, tiny print. Full so. size, yeah. Okay, yes, we can do that. I'll have, I will talk to your guys' advocate supervisors, have them, I might send out the PowerPoint to everybody, but I'll just have them go through and verify with all of their people that you guys have the right forms. So we'll get that covered. Um, Angela did bring up a point that I meant to cover for people who have multiple kids when filling out these boxes here. If you would just, what, what I think is the easiest, and you might already do this or have a system, but if you would just type out their name so like do their name in a dash and then type the information about that kid and then enter down and do the next kid just to kind of separate, separate out information in these sections for each child. I think that works pretty good just to keep things clear and organized. And then you can do the same with parents if parents aren't working case plan tasks together. If you just kind of split them up when reporting on these things, that's great. All right, I'm just gonna revisit, make sure I didn't miss anything. 
If you guys think of any other questions, let me know. Go ahead. Um, not related to the forms necessarily, but when I was trained, we were told that $5 was the maximum gift amount mm -hmm. for children for different occasions. Is that still the case? You know, I've never loved that rule. I have not seen it documented anywhere. Like that's not a national or Kansas CASA thing. Um, I think that was just something that the program had come up with at one point that they were comfortable with. Um, I, I think having experience of being a CASA myself at one point when I was appointed to a child, that didn't work for me. She was a teenager. We like went to Applebee's. My point exactly. Yeah, so I understand. $5 is like an insult to a teenager. <laughs> right, yeah. And so we just don't want you guys to feel like you have to spend money. But if you're okay doing that, if that's your choice, you want to take them to Applebee's or somewhere every once in a while, I'm fine with that. And you don't have to like get permission for that. So do you want that recorded? That's fine. Forms? Uh, no, I don't think okay. so. Okay. No. Thank you. Yeah. Also, like gifts. I know we kind of harp about we do have gifts available in our office and we want you guys to take advantage of those things. Um, and we don't want you to spend your own money. And we definitely discourage like taking children shopping because I think that kind of can become an expectation, especially with kids in care who maybe that's how they have been shown love or um, I don't, that's, that's something that they kind of come to expect out of their situation is people buying them things. And so we just don't want that to become like a key part of your relationship or a put you in a situation. Like I had a volunteer once who took her kid to the mall to walk around and she bought her a pair of Converse shoes, which are somewhat pricey. And so then she felt like every time the child expected her to buy her something in that price range. So we just try to be careful with that. Um, okay, so I have a question about um, when I showed kind of our totals for 2020. Um, and then I included in kind, and then the question is, is there a place to enter that? So um, that would be talking about the dollar amount. Mm, where did I have it? Here we go. Okay, so um, the in kind dollar amount here, so that 35,000, this is actually a number that we, um, we, we, you guys don't have to enter this dollar amount. We kind of calculate that here in the office and that's based off of your hours. So I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, your like one volunteer hour is worth, it's like 23 and some change. I think there's like a national in-kind dollar amount. And so we calculate, we take that, that dollar amount and calculate that based off of the hours that you guys spent working on case activities. So um, you don't have to worry about calculating that. We'll take care of that. You just tell us your time and your miles and contacts and visits. All right, anything else? I hope this was this helpful at all to you guys. Be a little more jazzed about doing monthly reports now. <laughs> yes, Bruce. I was wondering if you could review the training form also. The like the court report document? No, the one when we take training. And you want us to fill out that form for the class, for I instance. I don't remember what the form is. Was it like reporting your time spent during for, training? Uh, for uh, uh, educational like continue. units. Continuing education. Yeah. Oh. Continuing education form. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, 
Because yeah. that was a big secret to me. Sorry about that. I, I, um, so I Sarah can- Sarah lovingly educated me. Yeah, I can clarify here um, about that form a little bit. I'll pull it up and show it to you. Um, but I, I want to clarify. So like this presentation that I'm doing right now, you guys do not have to do the form because I see you, I know you're here, I know you participated. So you don't have to worry about doing the form and I've taken role. Um, but if you do something independently, so say you leave here and you go watch a Netflix documentary that we would count as CU time. Well, I wasn't there. I don't, I don't know for sure that you like what information you got out of that. So we just have to document in some way that you did that and that it was meaningful to you and you're gonna apply it to your role. So let me see if I can find it in these documents. Kim, following up on that CEU question, um, oh. so like I did the stewards of children light to darkness thing yesterday that um, the CAC presented. Yes. Um, and they're going to send out a certificate. So can I just send you a copy of that certificate or do I need to fill out a CEU form? No, you can send me the certificate. That's another okay. like exception to the form is if you do have some kind of documentation like that we will take that and put that in your file instead okay. of requiring the form so okay. yes that's a benefit to doing things that give you certificates um okay so here's here's what the form looks like um and you should these should be clickable when you have it in a word document so you can just choose which one of these um that you you participated in or if you watched a movie, read a book, whatever it is. Um, title, number of pages is just here for books and we use that to kind of determine how much time to give you. I usually like for most 300 plus page books, I would give four hours for that. So unless it was a really short book, you're, it's usually worth about four hours. Um, and then we just want just key points or just some information on what, what was covered during the presentation or what you got out of the book and then how that relates to your work as a volunteer. And then one thing that you will try to use in your work as a CASA. So this does not have to be a, a huge narrative report by any means. Um, we just want some simple few sentences um, to show that, that you did get some information out of whatever it was that you absorbed and how you're gonna use it. And then you can type in the hours that you're requesting here. Um, I always recommend if you're not sure before you start something, if you would just check with your advocate supervisor and verify how much credit that would be worth because I would hate for you to watch a documentary that you think you're gonna get 12 hours for and we tell you, well, we're, we can only give you four for that. That's kind of our maximum, I guess, rule of thumb is that anything is worth up to four hours because we don't want you to get all 12 hours from watching one Netflix documentary or from reading one book or whatever it might be. So um, you might just verify ahead of time that how many hours we'll give you, make sure it's worth the time you're gonna put into it. And then you will just put the hours in here. Um, sign this if you can. I'm cool on this document if you just even use like a cursive text or um, whatever it is, I'm, this isn't too particular for the signature. And then just send this to your advocate supervisor when it's done and they will confirm the hours, sign it, and then put it in your file and track it in our system. And I have started emailing this out. So just about any time I send out something that um, I know you will need to give us documentation for, I will include this. 
Yes, I, that was good advice. I'm trying to remember to do that every time. So it should be kind of everywhere. I don't know if you guys are familiar. I can cover this really quick. There is a documents page on our website for you guys. So if you go to the website, go here to volunteer. Nope. Volunteer home up here, maybe. Yeah, so you have a login for this. So if you don't know your login, um, let us know and we will get that information for you. But it kind of gives you special access to some things on our website. So log in there and then we have um, forms. I do not use this a lot. Okay, so I went to Welcome Casa Volunteers and clicked on that. And then there's some different, um, different subheadings here. But if you click on Continuing Education, we have some information and resource opportunities. And then also the Continuing Education Credit Report form is down here for you to download. So, I think I thought there was somewhere else that had more forms. I don't know. I need to play with the website a little bit. But if you didn't know this is available, this is another resource. And like I said, if you need login information, just let us know and we'll make sure we get that set up for you. Okay, we are at um, our hour mark. So you guys got your hour. So if you don't have any more questions, um, I will sign off and I will send out the PowerPoint and a link to the presentation just in case you want to rewatch anything again or um, if we missed, if anyone had to leave early. So I'll get those things sent out. And like I said, if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out anytime to your advocate supervisors or me and we'll get it figured out. Kim. Thank you, Kim. All right, Thank you. you're welcome. Thank have, you. have One a other question, Kim. So, yeah, um, Robert, go ahead. If you're going to send out the PowerPoint, uh -huh. could you on that same email send out a copy of each of the forms and then everyone's got them all together and one time? I could do that. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I'll do that. I'll send you guys the forms. Um, so yeah, that's perfect. Then you're, that takes away work for your advocate supervisors reaching out to everybody. So then it'll just say the forms are titled like monthly report form one, monthly report form two, and that corresponds with the number of children that you have. So just pick the form that you need. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good afternoon.